welcome to those of you and welcome to those of you who are watching online. We are so excited today. It's our new year. You know, our year in, at Hillview Church in terms of programming starts the day when we launch our theme. What we have done so far is to create a platform. The 6 plus 9 series allows us to respond to it's something that we'll be doing in the next years because it allows us to respond to other issues that we think are important, but we want to run on a theme. And today, I'm excited that we are launching a theme for 2024. And yeah, I think it's going to be one of the exciting moment for me. I've never done this uh, at Hillview Church. I think I've never. You know, one of my greatest fear when we were starting this church was, what am I going to preach every Sunday? That was one of, yeah, I felt like that was a big burden. I felt like I was not sure. I mean, this Saturday I had a discussion with some of the young pastors that God is raising. It was our first class, and I was telling them, the call of God is progressive. You are never sure of the next step until you get there. Yeah, so I was afraid. I wondered what am I going to preach. And whether you like it or you believe it, I told you there are some things where I don't need accolades. I have been judging myself because majority of you would not be capable of judging me technically. I have been doing well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are areas where people cannot. Yeah, so I was afraid of that area. But when I look back, I think I thank God that has given me the grace. In the last eight years, there have been a day when I had no message, no day. Yeah. And, and I can tell you how tough it is. You know, I, I was a lecturer before and I was a consultant. I teach nine modules. All of them have templates. I change for the client. This one, uh, this one. So I just change for the clients. And then I run on the same template. All our consultants work as processes. I just take. Preaching means every Sunday I come to church, it's same people. And I need to change material. Yeah, so it was work. So it's not easy. Yeah, please, if you go to any other church, respect your pastor. Because it takes time, grace, skill, research, and anointing to always have something profound, impactful to share. So I was afraid of that. But now since I was here, I think I kind of graduated over what to preach. It was now what is going to become our theme. Because a theme also restricts you. Because it means you can't preach the Bible anyway. You have to be located within a theme. That's also is pressure on the pastor. I'm trying to help you relate with what we are doing because for some people they think a pastor is an average guy. Uh, we deal with a lot. Yeah, and it takes planning, strategy, execution, a lot. Yeah, so the next pressure was on the theme, and it has always been tough. But this morning, I'm excited that we have a theme we have never had in the last nine years. In my thinking strategically, I was thinking that I'll get into this after we go to the 10th year. I can tell you, if you're a scholar, you, all these eight years, I've been preaching within a sphere of theology called social theology. So I've always been teaching social theology. And by the way, I am not a social theologist. I'm an Old Testament scholar, a Hebrew level five student. Uh, that means a lot, which means I've done introduction to Arabic. So I've never done anything that sits more within my area. I've always been more social theology because I am dealing with social issues that need God's perspective. But this morning I'm happy uh, to reveal a theme to you that is the first at Hillview Church. And I'll tell you what I was looking for when we came up with this theme. I was looking for a theme that can have internal transformation power. In other words, it will be able to transform a believer because, yeah, I, I, I was seeing an area of need among us to be internally transformed so that your faith can work for you. 
You don't just come to church. Your faith works for you because faith is meant to produce the results. But at the same time, I was also looking for a theme that would be able to help us as the church to have impact in our community and the people that we, that we live in. Because I recognize we have good programming here in terms of production. The messages are good. The music is good. Is that not true? Yeah, but I feel like we are impacting few people. As much as a lot of our production will be good, few people come. And as a pastor, I need to be concerned about reaching out to people and bringing more people. So I needed a theme instead of imagine, just do it, which is more personal. Uh, Paratletos, what was the last one? God's purpose. I needed something that can hit internally and hit externally. And I'm glad I have it. Uh, I have it. Can you stand? Can you stand? This theme is going to change your life. I don't care what background you come from. I think you should just rejoice with us that you are going to have an opportunity to be transformed. No one can listen to what we are going to discuss this year and remain the same. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, for the year 2024, and it is knowing Jesus and making him known. Come on, clap for that. So that's what I want to do for you this year, is that you need to know Jesus and make him known. It's going to be an interesting journey because majority of you, no disrespect, please hear me well. Majority of you, I love you, I really respect you, and you know I honor you. But I've recognized over the years, this is why I've left, I thought I would go up to 10 years. You, how many of you like Jesus? Yeah, yeah. Majority of you like Jesus, and majority of you have heard about the name Jesus, but I'm going to take you into the world of knowing Jesus. It's going to be a rough ride. It's going to be a transformative ride, because anyone who gets to know Jesus can never be the same. Clap your hands and sit and take your seats. Now, the next aspect of this theme is making Jesus known. And we have thought about something that we have never done in this church again. We are now going to be, you know, we have chosen a location that is going to be a place of our focus in the year 2024. And this year, in the year 2024, as a church, we want to make Jesus known in phase four. So we have a project we call phase four invasion. Here is our plan. We want every household in phase four to know about Jesus, to know about Hillview Church, and where possible to partner with institutions that are there. We have met Bokosi, we have met institutions that are there. We want to do charity there. We want to impact women there. We want to impact men. We want to impact institutions there, the schools, everyone in phase four. So everything that we do as a church this year, we want to take a special focus on phase four. So here is to the knowing Jesus, an internal perspective is going to change your life. And making him known is going to be phase four focused. And we have a project coming for you called phase four invasion that I'm going to be asking all of you to participate in making Jesus known in phase four. We are already planning for, an, for a Hillview open day. At phase four, we have talked to Kosi, we are meeting other people and other stakeholders. It's going to be a funny day. I want us not to make it churchy, but I want us to go and sell ourselves like we have a product. Because indeed, Hillview and Jesus are products. They need to be sold and they need to be taken out. Can you clap your hands if you agree on that? So that's what we are going to be doing for this whole year. Phase four and Jesus. Phase four and Jesus. Phase four and Jesus. If you stay in other areas, pray that we come there. But for this year, it's phase four only. Whatever we are doing goes to phase four. If you want to give anything, phase four. If you want to pray, phase four. If you want to play, phase four. It's knowing Jesus and making him known in phase four. Any other person that can benefit in your relationship in others, we thank God for that. But let's go to the text. It's, it's going to be 
It's going to be an interesting journey. And I want to start it this way. Studying Jesus and knowing Jesus has always been a mystery over the years. It's 2,024 years now since Jesus was started. It's actually 2,050 years, so to say, since Jesus was introduced as a person in the world. Now, when you study somebody like Jesus, it's a problem, I can tell you. Because Jesus himself is a problem. Jesus himself is so unique. One, the guy was born without anyone providing the sperm. Makes it difficult. Two, the guy died and he rose again. Anyone who have ever done that? Three, the guy could just see people having been bored in a wedding and he would turn water into wine. I mean, there's so many mysteries about who Jesus is and how he lived and the whole world, and I'm saying the whole world, has been studying this guy, and we seem not to arrive at who exactly was he. Jesus was fully man. Jesus was fully God. Bring the same two spheres of learning and study them. Study God. You need to open so many books to know a being called God. Study man. Look at how many social science fields and how many science fields study a human being. From human anthropology to science that is based on physiology and the mind. It's, it's a complex thing. Now, if you are to study a person who has two important qualities, the divine and the human, it's a lot of study. And I'm going to complicate this again. If you are to study this person from the Bible, is a lot of study. And here's how I want to start as a good teacher. I want to introduce you to the terms of reference of our study. And here's the first terms of reference. It is the word no. No. In Sutswana, it. Closer to my name, why it. In Hebrew, yada. In, he in Greek, it gets complicated. And that's our starting point. There are several ways that can be used for no in Greek. And I want to start with the first one because I want you to get the context and the scope of our theme. The first word that we can use for studying any theme or for knowing any theme, which is important if we want to know Jesus, who is being presented to us by the Greeks. Because Jesus is Hebrew, but is being presented to us by the Greeks. And the Greeks are the fathers of knowledge. The invention of writing started with the Egyptian, but it is the Greeks who have developed the modern science as we know about it, or human knowledge as we know about it. It is Socrates, it is Plato, it is Epicurean, it is Heraclitus. Those are the fathers of knowledge as we know about it. And anyone who makes any inquiry, which is a desire to know, or any research, must be enjoyed with the understanding of the basic. And I want to introduce you to the concept. So the first way we can know anything, or even know Jesus, is through a process called, we use the Greek word called logos. Logos represent a type of learning that comes from reason. In other words, as a human being, there are things that you can know on the basis of reason. That is knowledge. You can say, I know something because you have reasonable understanding about that object. Now, in English, the word is one. I told you I went to, 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 uh, uh, to Greece and I was with Tepo. We were in a dinner. Yeah, sometimes you need to have the better side of life. In dinner with one of the, yeah, an established Greek men. And he said to us, the Greek has borrowed to English more than 59,000 words. So you can see we are speaking about no. In English, it's one word. In Greek, you can go up to seven or so, from four to seven, depending on where, what you are talking about. Using the word no. So the first level of knowing is to know by reason. This refers to there are professors right now who know theology and we are New Testament experts who know Jesus by reason more than you. 
but they are not saved. But they know, logically know Jesus by reasoning. So the first element of knowing Jesus is at a logos level. Who he is. The second level of knowing Jesus is of, of knowing anything in the Greek understanding is the word Edo. Now the word Edo represents knowing through intuition. This is the type of knowledge that you get when you know about something based on feelings, based on excitement. It's like, it's like when a guy sees a girl and he says, oh my God, who is she? She has seen her, she has seen the structure, but she doesn't know her. But that knowing is normally based on feelings and has no proof. Intuitive knowledge by structure in terms of psychological analysis, it is, it is promulgated based on our senses of perception. It is based on our external interpretation of things that are not necessarily factual. So when you say, I know, at an intuition level, you don't have proof, but you are just feeling something. And I think part of the problem today with the church is we have people who just feel the name of Jesus, like, like the guy that he can give us Christmas, and like, like the guy that he has very beautiful concepts, like you can pray and talk to him when you don't see him. So we, our knowing of Jesus is at an Edo level. It's at a concept that we like and can interact with us and fascinate us. Edo. Knowing by feeling, by perception, but not by reality and not by experience. It's a lower level of knowing. It's like logos, it's information accumulation about a thing. The third word, very important in the Greek understanding, is the word ginosko. Ginosko means to know by experience. It is what has led today on what is called experiential knowledge. It is only it is not only I have an idea about who that girl is. I have an idea about what Francis Town is all about. I have an idea about what America is about. It means to experience it. I've been there. I've touched it. I've seen it. I've been there. So experiential knowledge, it's, it becomes factual and it derives from there. That's where we get a model of positivism, calling it science as we know it about. Because then it has proofs, it has experience, it's tangible, you can feel it. When the Apostle Paul uses the word, I want to know Christ, he uses the word ginoski. It is, I want to have an experience with this guy. I want to experience him. At a high level also, very important to us who study the Bible, is that Dionysko also can represent at a figurative level, the word is used to mean sexual intercourse. You would understand that when couples, are, when people are married and they are having sex, they get to know each other. There's a difference between just knowing somebody and having sex with them. When you have sex with them, you have had an experience with them. And that experience changes your discourse, your thinking, and it gives you a different sense of who that person is. This is why part of having sex with multiple people becomes a problem because then you have various experiences which fight you and your understanding because you have experienced a person. In the Hebrew understanding, the Bible leads us to a place of revelation, and that's the fourth way in which we can know something. You read in the Bible, when you are reading the Old Testament, a place I know better. The Bible would say, and Adam knew Eve, and then they bore a child. Have you ever read that? Like you, you, you hear the Bible says, and David knew so and so, and they had children. And then you think that the process was skipped. No, it is embedded in the understanding of the Hebrew people now, not the Greek, the Hebrew people, that the place of knowing entails intercourse that produces product that represents the interaction of the two. I'm going to repeat that. It's important for where we are going. The process of knowing 
brings about two things or more that then reproduces an identity that is having the characteristics and the qualities of the products that we're interacting at a knowing level. You understand? So the man and the woman meet and there's a product called a child. They have known each other. And then the Bible leads us into the fourth, yeah, it's still on the fourth level, on Revelation. So Revelation now derives out of the experience that have been gained. The Hebrew people go to insight. When you know by revelation, you are knowing by insight. You go beyond your experience because sometimes your experience can limit you and how far you go. There may be people that are sitting here today that your experiences right now are your problem. And you need a different revelation of your experience to deliver yourself from where you are. Sometimes experience, if it bites you so early, it can eliminate your inclination to things that God gives to them to you freely because you experience them the wrong way, the wrong time, in a different manner. So in the progress of knowing Jesus, I want you to know the context. That when we say no Jesus, we are not using the English word have perception about who Jesus is. We are starting at Gnosko level and we are going at Revelation level. The knowledge of Jesus at a Logos level and at an Edo level, it's functional but does not change people. But knowing Jesus at a Gnosko level changes you. And here is a paradigm shift in knowing Jesus. If you ask me, why should I know Jesus, Pastor? Here's the first major reason. Is that you can never use yourself until you know Jesus. No one can authentically know themselves until they know Jesus. You know why? I can give you several proofs. Number one, nothing was created without Jesus. Number one. Number two, nothing was created without Everything was created for him. Number three, he holds the fiber of everything that exists. Number four, he is the only one that when you have intercourse with, he would reveal to you the versions of yourself that you don't know. So this is why the pursuit of knowing Jesus is important because men in the pursuit of finding out who Jesus is, they meet themselves. And I'm inviting you into a journey that in case you are struggling with some issues, you are struggling with your identity, you are struggling with your purpose, you don't seem to know why you are here. If you get to know Jesus, he would show you who you are, why you are here, and how to apply yourself. No one has ever met Jesus and remained the same. So let's go into this next dimension. It is going to be important for you to follow me well, especially for those of you who have been in the church for a long time. Because most of us know church. Most of us, we even know the pastors. Most of us, we even know the process. We know how service runs. We know a lot of things about church. But that is at an idol and at a logos level. And our knowledge does not transform us. We need to get into the Gnosko level so that the knowledge about Jesus that you have transforms you. You need to go to Revelation so that the knowledge about Jesus transforms how you do your life. It's like the problem with modern universities today is that we have our kids graduating at a university level and the type of knowledge that they have have not transformed them to become practitioners of value. That is similar to a believer who goes to church, but the, what he knows about God cannot transcend into his workplace, into his relationship, into his way of management of man, into his life and make him a better person. I hate religion. That makes people pursue things that are not functional. That's not the plan of God for us. Knowing Jesus at its lowest, best, it should transform you. No one go to the text. This is why you read the Bible. No one has ever met Jesus and remained the same. Yeah. Go and look at your Bible. And it's still true today that if you can come into contact with him, your life should change. 
And today, I'm not attacking anyone. I'm not pushing anyone down. I'm trying to all of us who might have done church but have never attended, have never met Jesus, that there is a high level you need to go to. Least churching becomes difficult, burdensome, and tiring to you because it's not working for you. But it starts at a place of knowing Jesus. Now, let's go back and withdraw so that we can come in. Let's ask the first question. How do human beings get to know God for the first time? And I know if I was to ask that question and make the mic move from one person to another, I'd hear a different question. Or oh, in a dream. Or oh, oh, when you, or oh, when you, or oh, when you. So we have different versions and we don't have time to that. But I want to give you a strong biblical perspective. And I've told you we are moving from social theology to biblical perspective. Which means for some of you who have religious beliefs, we are going to have to move swiftly across this. And it's going to be a slightly a good ride, but it might be rough on your side. Because there are some of the misconceptions we hold as if they are godly and true when they are wrong. Let's answer the question. How, what is God's agenda for meeting a human being who is a sinner, who doesn't know him, who is lost? How does a sinner get to meet Christ or God for the first time? Let's start at Romans chapter number 9. No, not chapter number 9. Chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10 and we are in verse number Nine. So the scripture says, If thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now look at me. The first area the first area anyone else can ever meet Jesus or know Jesus. You don't see the word know there, but it is embedded, and I'm about to show you. The first area anyone can ever know Jesus is called through the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How do we get to know God? What is to know God? To have a gnosko with God. To have an experiential knowledge that you know I am saved. That you know I have been changed. It's when you do what? You acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. What does the scripture say? You shall be saved. How do you get saved? When you confess. And when there's an alignment between, alignment between confession and believing the heart, it's a tick. It's like when the sperm and the ovum meet. It's a tick. It has to become pregnancy unless there are complications. So when there's alignment between what we are saying, Jesus, you are Lord. I believe that you were raised from the dead. Then, Ginosko takes place. Psh, you get saved. You get saved because you have called on the name of the Lord. And the scripture says, he who calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. And I know what religion has taught us and what we have seen as a practice in the church is that majority of us think that we get saved by confessing our sins. And that's not true. We get saved by calling on on the name of the Lord. Go and look for a scripture and bring it to me. We are opening up to fellows and I'm inviting you. you there are definitely going to be questions. Please write them and forward them to us. I'll always start a session for the next two months. There's going to be a lot of contradiction I'm going to do to help you. Move from religion to faith. That is functional. Look for a scripture that says, if you confess your sins, you'd be saved. And I know what First John chapter number 1, verse number 9 says. Confess your sins and you would be what? Forgiven. 
And that's for a believer. John says, if we, we, he's including himself as a saint. He says, if we confess, he's faithful to cleanse us by his blood. And that's for a believer. So a believer can sin. And he says, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. And that's for a believer because reading the Bible well, the basic principles of hermeneutics is you need to know when God is speaking to Israel, when is God is speaking to the church, when God is speaking to, to, to Israel, to the church, and to the office bearers. Very important. So we get saved by saying, Jesus, you are Lord. And by saying, Jesus, I believe in your death. Those are the primary requirements. In other words, and this is something very important, and I'm not trying to discourage anyone, and I know it's sensitive, and I know it's religious. God does not hear a sinner at any point unless a sinner says, God, you are Lord, unless at the Lordship of Jesus. And I know all, most of sinners pray. To who? To who listens to them? I can't answer that. But a biblical understanding does not give a room for God to hear a sinner except at the interaction of acknowledgement of the Lordship and the belief in Jesus. Once that happens, then there is an intercourse. The Spirit of God comes into your spirit in a process called remission, the transformation or the removal of your sinful nature. Because remember, before salvation, which is then what allows you to confess your sin, you are a sinner. Your nature is sinful. You don't have the nature of God in you. You don't have the life of God. Here's the major difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that Moses... Abraham, David, you list all of them, did not have what you have. They did not have the life of God in them. They did not have the nature of God in them. They did not have any intercourse with God. In the New Testament, when you call on God, you experience the remission of sins. Hebrews chapter number 9 verse number 22 says, there is no remission of sin. The word remission means complete removal of sin. There is no remission of sin until... There is the shedding of the blood. When Jesus died, he shed up his blood. So when you come to Christ and you say, Jesus, you are Lord, and you get saved, guess what God does? In his clock or his book of books, he backdates you to Calvary. And Calvary wipes away your sins. Because Jesus, when he died, he wiped them up. So that Psalms 103 verse number 12 can be fulfilled where it says, He has taken our sins as far as the east is from the west. So once your sins have been taken away, then 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 17, okay. And I want to read it because it's important. So the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 17, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, look at me, look at me, because I'm showing you a process that is very technical in scripture. So, you confess, first activity, God, when you confess the acknowledgement of the Lordship of Christ, and there's an alignment with your heart, with belief, then your sinful nature gets taken away from your spirit man. Sin gets removed, and then there's a new creature that God forms in you which is the new born again you. And that creature, it's fertilized. It's fertilized by the life of God and the nature of God. We call it a new born again spirit man. It's a fresh, powerful human being. If there is anything, and I, and I was telling them in the first service, because I wanted to wait until 10 years, because if I start on this line, I would not stop. Because as the church, and as people who have come to church, we have made ourselves religious and we have no clue about the new born again person in you. The scripture says, there if anyone is in Christ, and I'm going to show you the dynamics of preposition in the text and the placement of the same Jesus at different discourse scope that shows who he is. And I know I'm complicating it, but it's the first introduction. Because the scripture says, Hebrews 13 verse number 8, Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. You can see that is a 
that is a chronological understanding of Christ. Because Christ is the same in chronology of time, but different in dispensation and different in avenues, spheres, and incidents. That's Jesus. For you to serve him well, you need to know him. But here is the first thing that I want to surprise all of you with. Is that inside of you, when you say, Jesus, you are Lord, I believe with your heart, there is a new born creature inside of you, fertilized by the egg of God. And that being inside of you knows no failure or no limit. The question is, are you living on a new born again model? Or you are still living on your old self model? I, I, I tell you, I, I did a lot of study here, but I ran away when I was doing it some times back because I recognized I am not what the Bible says I am. My life does not reflect what the Bible says I am. Because the new born again believer who has had an intercourse with Christ cannot fail. Read your Bibles very well. I'm going to show you. This is what I'm saying. This is going to be a long journey. And if we go this way, the scripture says, thank God for Christ who gives us what? Triumph. We have it. He gives us all things. But if you look at your life and you don't see them, I'm inviting you into a discussion with yourself and with God. Because the new born again creature, put your hand on your chest and say, I'm a new creature. That creature there is a seed of God. It cannot fail. Look, if you read it in John chapter number 1, verse number 12, it says, it says, to many that received him, and I, maybe I'm going, yeah, I'll go there next time so that I can take time, but I, I want to show you something. To many that have received him, he has given them what? The power to be called what? Sons of God. I want to go to the light. Even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. So that new born again spirit man in you is not of the will of the flesh, is not of the will of man, it is of the will of God. And he cannot fail. So that's the problem of the church. Majority of us, we are living far below who God says we should be. Because we are a seed of the almighty God. That seed has everything inside it. Put your hand on your chest and say, I have everything, I have everything. inside of me. Inside. Because there is the king inside of you. There is a seed of greatness inside of you. Everything that you need, the life of God and the nature of God, I'm going to prove it to you. It's embedded in you at salvation. When you meet, that's the wrong way, when you get to have intercourse for the first time with God. He gives you new life, new energy, new everything. And, and I like the discussion. Let's follow it. Let's go to the text. And if anyone is in a Christ, then he's a what? New creature. Put your hand on a, on a chest and say, I'm a new creation. Look at the next statement. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Right at that intercourse. Imagine meeting a guy. You meet a guy and when you meet this guy, he says, you know what, I love you, baby. I mean, you turn my world upside down. You are the thing. I mean, nothing can replace you. Uh, I've never known anything like this. You are, you are the only one. And you know what? All your past are erased. It's unfortunate that we don't have that girl and that boy. Who has the capacity to say to you, yeah, because this one's they lie. They'll say, no, baby, let's forget about uh, uh, when they want you, is, let's forget about your past. Then tomorrow they raise your past against you. <laughs> Tell me, what did you do when you were with that guy? Ah. We had said it's a close chapter. Oh, when you went abroad, can we talk about that? 
I thought it's in the past. We said we are starting in a, in a clean state. No. C can, we, can we clear it? I want, to, I want to be clear. Can we clear it? And, and you say it. You say it. Oh, Jesus is a good guy. Once he comes in, he says, you know what? I would never want to have a discussion with your past. Let's close it. Everything that is old about you, I am flushing it into the beam. And the psalmist have said, as far as the east is from the west, so has he removed what? All your sins. And we have people in the church who are still struggling with their mistakes they did five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. You are still being beaten by your past. You are living on an old, new, on an old man. The scripture says the old man should do what? Die. Amen. Kill the old man. Let the new guy, the new born again creature in you live. Otherwise, you are going to be tormented by the thoughts of your past. I'm told you it's going to be hard. Because the new born again creature, born of God, full of the life of God, with internal life, not lacking anything, cannot have depression. I'm taking it harder. He cannot suffer from depression. He cannot have things that bottles us. How many of us cry in pain of the past? That the past truly incarcerates us that we can't move anywhere. And if you have a discussion, it's a pain of eight years ago. It's a pain of 20 years ago. Jesus wants you to be free from your past. That you find peace with incidents and tragedies that occurred in the past. You can look them into the face and say, I am now in Christ. But majority of us do church, and church cannot clear your past. Majority of us do pastors, and pastors cannot clear your past. You'd be coming to church, but you have a burden, a load of your past, because you have never met Jesus. Anyone who sleeps with Jesus gets transformed. And the first meeting with Jesus is at salvation. Let your old go. And here's what the scripture says. Choose who to believe. Whose report would you believe? Are you going to believe the report of the world? Because you may not feel it, but God says the old is gone. You may not see it, but God says the old is gone. If you give your life to Jesus here today, when you leave this place, the old is gone. Walk on that truth. But we have a model of believers who wants to be too modernized and they choose their experiences and their reality than the reality of God. This scripture is not a promise. The scripture does not say, if anyone comes to Christ, he shall become a new creature. It's present tense. You become instantly new creation. And instantly the old is passed away. Perfect past tense. It is not the old shall pass away as you become bad. And once you receive the truth of the scripture and you act on it and you internalize it, it produces the same results it has said. But we are doing church and not doing Jesus. And look at the next thing. He says, behold, the new has come. I like it in the old King James Version. It says, all things have become new. Whose report are you going to believe? Your husband, your spouse, your colleague, how people give you feedback. Jesus says, if you are in him, all bad past things, and even bad good old ones, past. You are starting on a clean slate. I read something for the for the first service, I want to read it for you because I think I liked my way of thinking and I felt like I can write a comment. Uh, please trust us. Uh, just like you are expecting your old field, we also know what we are doing here. Here's my, here's, here's my commentary uh, notes on 2 Corinthians chapter number, number 5, that's number 15. It's a commentary note. Therefore, when anyone gets born again, God gives him a brand new start. Just like Adam. No past record. Only the beautiful future. A brand new start. That's what salvation is. When you meet Jesus and you say, Jesus, you are my Lord, and I acknowledge you that you rose from the dead, Jesus right there gives you what? A brand 
new start. No baggage of who left you, who was there, who cheated you, who did no, no baggage. Everything closed up. Let's start fresh. So he gives you a new, what is that? He gives you a, just like Adam, with no past record of wrong and full access to the wealth of God. Second Corinthians, chapter number five. If anyone is in Christ, new creation, beautiful things that are in Christ. I want to know Jesus. I want to gnosk Jesus. To have an experiential knowledge with him. I'm tired of hearing that he, he did things for people. I want to experience it. That's salvation. I'm tired of hearing what he did for the Israelites. I want to experience it. I'm tired of reading about him and Paul. I want to have a revelation of him. I want to know him. Because when you know him, you will know yourself. That's the beauty of Jesus. Just by reading this text, Jesus is saying to us, guys, you are not who you used to be. You are a new creation. Just coming into contact with Jesus transforms you into a new creature with full of capabilities and abilities, new opportunities before you. But we believe the world. That reminds you of your mistake you did at college. That reminds you of your young whatever. That reminds you of your past. And you can't move. Jesus says, I can give you a clean slate. Fresh start. If you come to know me, not know church. Majority of us like church. Like church a lot. And sometimes when you focus on the processes and the activities of church, you miss Jesus. And anyone who works for Jesus on Locos or on Edo would become tired. But at a Gnosko level, it's having, this is why, the same Hebrew word, but different uh, a Greek word, is the word koinonia. It means the fellowship, but it says the same thing. Because koinonia means the interaction of objects, the getting into each other. That's fellowship. It says, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you forever. Why? When you are in Christ and you have had contact, then you keep that contact through what? Fellowship. You keep on getting in Jesus. I'm going to show you what we are in him. And he keeps getting in you. And I'm going to show you who you are. It's a continuous disposition of the text to show you dimensions of who Jesus is at what scope and what level. If you just know church, if you come here and you don't raise up your hand, you don't ask God to say, Lord, can I experience you? I'm tired of listening to this young man making noise. Can I, can I, oh, now I'm an old man. Can I, can I experience you? It has to be that. It has to be more than head knowledge. It has to be more than religion. It has to be something you know beyond knowing. Like feel it and know it. Be deceived at it beyond empirical knowledge. I can tell you about empiricism and epicureanism as a, as a theory of knowledge. It lacks. You need to experience the grace. Because then you will be different. You become a different woman, a different man, a different girl because you have had interaction with Christ. May I urge you as we begin this series, seek to know him. beyond pastors to have an interaction and an encounter with Jesus will change your life. Let's stand on our feet. And we want to, of course, this is the most important activity in the world and this is the most ever when you come to Jesus, when you get born again, you are getting the most expensive asset that brings transformation in your life, into your life. This is why 
get it right. Because once you have known Jesus, making him known becomes easy. It's like when you have met a good man, or when you see ladies, uh, uh, the most of the time when people lie the most is when they have met you. what we're doing here is called relay testimonies. One person came no, to know Jesus. He took the Jesus he knew to another one and another one took the Jesus he knew to another one. That should be a story in church. And just come to church and know him. So if there's anyone in the house today who says, Pastor, I hear you. I want to know Jesus as my son. Keep clapping for them as they do. And as we run through this series, and we make more altar calls, because I'm going to do that. If you have been coming to church maybe for years, but you still don't know Jesus, please don't miss an opportunity for an encounter because of your integrity. If you feel like you want to receive him, come. Because this is the place for your transformation. Thank you guys for making a decision. <laughs>